Hey, this is Adam with uh, Mile High Stash, the podcast that asks what five albums you would take to a remote Colorado cabin in the event of a zombie apocalypse. Um, armed with only food, water, and a crank-powered Victrola. Uh, I gotta say, if I were stranded in a Rocky Mountain cabin, I wouldn't mind being there with Hazel Miller. Uh, she's one of the most well-known singers in Colorado history, but she's also just this warm, generous, hilarious presence in any room. The zombies would probably leave us alone if they met Hazel. Uh, this is Black History Month, of course, and I was lucky enough to sit down with Hazel, who is a proud, strong, fucking whip, smart black woman. It's so easy to admire in so many ways. Uh, uh, she came to my house and talked about her journey from the projects in Louisville, Kentucky, to Denver, uh, where she became a star pretty quickly. Um, check out Hazel's music on Spotify after you listen to our chat, or just go see her play live everywhere on the Front Range. Um, personally, I'll be playing live with a band called Rolling Harvest this Friday night, March 3rd, at Mountain Sun in Boulder. Um, if you want to come say hello. Uh, Rolling Harvest will also be playing number 38 in Denver Thursday, March 23rd. And as I may have said, Fox Feather, the great Fox Feather band, will be performing and being interviewed for a live recording of an episode of Mile High Stash on Saturday, April 1st at number 38 in Denver. That is going to be something else. So please join us if you're around. Uh, in the meantime, Hazel Miller. You'll hear my conversation with Hazel shortly. You might hear Hazel if you tune in to The Colorado Sound, 105.5 The Colorado Sound, uh, which is the best radio station in Colorado and can be heard all over the mountains as well as down in Boulder and Denver, the Colorado Sounds DJs play whatever the hell they want, and it's always great. Um, this episode of My Last Stash is also brought to you by Wood Songs, where you can buy an instrument or get one fixed, and brought to you by an amazing chain of dispensaries called The Dab. Hazel Miller was overjoyed when I gave her some CBD gummies from the dab and i'm very grateful to the dab for its support of my life stash anyway thanks for listening and we'll talk on the other side The Dab is a veteran-owned dispensary with seven locations in Colorado, owned and operated by Lance Perryman, a longtime Colorado resident, father of four, and retired Army intelligence officer. The Dab offers everything from flour and edibles to pre-rolls, rosin, and accessories like pipes, paper, and pens. Whether you're in search of exotic flour or chill CBD, head to a Dab location in Denver, Aspen, Glenwood Springs, Louisville, or even Parachute, Colorado today, or order at thedab303.com. Don't forget to mention this episode of Mile High Stash in the next 30 days at any DAB location to receive 10% off your purchase. How come the drummers are always the smart guys in the band and nobody know. seems true? to know it? Every band I've ever been in, really, the drummers are always the guys that are the techie guys, oh. the smart engineering guys. we got to figure out... All this different gear, maybe, is yeah. that's why. I always thought the bass players were like the silent, smart ones. They're, They're usually, silent and smart, you know, but mine yeah. has a very devious sense of humor that oh, we yeah. love. <laughs> I wanted to say, before I say anything else, we have a, <laughs> all these sponsors of these episodes, and one of them is um, a dispensary that has like a big six or seven locations. They're called The Dab. And the guy... Lance specifically said, if you have Hazel Miller on, I want to sponsor Hazel Miller. From, from my yeah. days when I used to smoke. Okay. As soon as it got legal, I stopped smoking. Okay, so I was going to ask you because he gave me a bunch of stuff. And if you want some CBD gummies or you want some, some actual marijuana, it's right here. If you want, really? If you want anything. I, don't tease me. I'm straight Because I'm always looking for something that will yeah. make me sleep. This is 
This exactly is the what one? I use because it doesn't have THC. And I have such an active mind that I'm just I have, like... It's, it's hard to turn it off. Know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So these will make me sleep. Yo, for sure. Okay, cool. Yeah, oh, well, yeah, yeah. I don't want to take give all you, of them. I'm going to give you a bag of later. Okay. Of them. Okay, that's cool. Um, the first thing that I want to ask you is just, you know, up where up are you from and what's your musical um, mm. upbringing? Um, <laughs> I think you're from Louisville. Louisville, Kentucky. Yeah. I am the fifth of seven children, and my mother had a rule. Saturdays was spent cleaning the house. We lived in the projects, two two story apartment, and um, uh, my brother would put on uh, a record, and we'd play it all the way through on one side. Somebody flip it over, mm -hmm. and by the end of the day, we will have played everything from Motown to Sly and the Family Stone. And uh, first time I ever heard Sly, my, my a friend of his loaned him the album, and. Oh my God! I've been singing it ever since. Love it. What's so, your favorite song by Sly? Um, uh, um, I'm gonna get in trouble. <laughs> um, dance to the music. Oh, yeah. da, 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 dance. All we need is a drama. <laughs> That's been sampled so many times too. That that bear, 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 bear. Oh. and that, that drum part. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So it sounds like you don't remember a time in your life the music wasn't around. No, no, no. Um, when I was in the first grade, I had a nun. I raised Catholic. My father's family from Central Kentucky, and I had a nun in the first grade, and uh, she would say, "Sing louder, they'll follow you." So in the third grade, I got to sing with the eighth graders one year for Christmas, and I was thrilled, absolutely thrilled. And I think I've been looking for that attention ever since. <laughs> <laughs> so when did you have your first uh, professional gig? I think I was a junior in high school. A friend of mine, um, I can't think of her name. Oh, she's going to kill me. Denise. She was singing with a band, and uh, she had some horrible, horrible cold. And her mother said, no, you can't go. And so they gave me a tryout. And I learned eight songs, and I went to this job. It was a battle of the bands, and we made 50 bucks a piece. I thought I was rich. That was a lot back then. Oh, my honestly. God. I, thought I, was... I, I graduated yeah. from high school in 1971. 50 bucks was a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> well, even right now, you know, bands are starting to come together, and, um, you know, the, there was, like... Uh, an agreement signed in Denver a few years ago that that musicians shouldn't work for less than a hundred dollars each. So it's still, it's not easy out there. No, when I talk to no. young people and I talk, and a lot of kids call me, well, Miss Miller, what should I charge? I said, what do you think you're worth? Yeah. I don't know. I said, you don't think you're worth a hundred bucks? You got gas. You got to move all that gear. Then you got to move it all out. Then you got gas to get home. I said, 100 bucks will cover actually being there doing the job, and the other 50 bucks will cover your gas. Yeah. yeah. Well, what if they won't pay me? I said, well, then go in, fill the place up, and the next time they call you, tell you that the price is 100 bucks a man. Mm -hmm. And some of them call me back and tell me it works, and some call me back and say, well, it worked the third time. I said, well, all that matters is that it worked. Yeah. Do you know Bonnie Sims from Bonnie and the Clydes? I know who she is. I don't yeah. think she remembers me. Oh, but... I'm sure she does. Um, we had a conversation about the power of no. About at some point, you can't say yes to every gig. Um, you got to value yourself, mm -hmm. and they offer you essentially no money, and you say no. No. I, I my my thing now is, um, uh, you know, people will call me and say, well. Um, we're doing this fundraising. We got a thousand dollar budget. I said, you know, I want to help you out, but my fundraiser is me and my six band members. Yeah. And um, if you can't do two hundred bucks a piece, and we supply the sound and our own lighting, then I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. Okay, so uh, you happen into uh, this gig. 
in high school. <laughs> um, and then what happens with you? Well, I uh, hung around that band, and whenever they needed me, I'd sing back up for her. And there was a, two guys in the band that sang. And then um, I got married, and you made a face there. Yeah, well, <laughs> it it wasn't blissful, but yeah. I made a choice, and he didn't want me to sing. And uh, he said it made him nervous, and I really missed it. And a year went by, no, we're not quite a year, and it wasn't working out. And um, and then I spent another few months trying to figure it out. He moved. I stayed where I was, and uh, my son was about two. And uh, I started showing up at, I'd, I'd hear a band in my neighborhood rehearsing, and I'd just show up with my little boy, and, and we'd hang out, and I'd wave and go. And then finally, this guy said, hey, you want to sing something? Because you, you keep coming by. So I did uh, this Aretha Franklin song, and uh, um, I got a call. They were going to let go of their singer and hire me, and I felt guilty about that. So I said, no, when she's ready to go, call me. And I just kept going. And then um, I got a call one day. Uh, these same guys asked me to do a wedding. And uh, then we did another battle of the bands. And um, the other lady, she, uh, she was married. She was pregnant with her third child. And her husband said, enough. And I got the gig. <laughs> I kept it for four years. And it sounds like that's been your life ever since, really. I um, I got I I I left Louisville in 1984, headed to L.A., and I made it as far as Denver. The, the we had this enormous U-Haul truck, and it kept breaking down. Who's we? Uh, I had my two sons, and a friend of mine who had a very abusive husband, and. The night we were loading into the van, into the big truck, her husband beat her up pretty bad. And I said, oh, look, God. if you grab some clothes for you and your kids, you can come with me. And uh, we made it as far as Denver. She got married again out here. And we had uh, my van attached to the back of the truck. All six kids were back there because I brought a friend of mine's son. My kids were 6, 12, and the other kid I brought with me was 18. He was my babysitter, and he wasn't going to let me leave without him. Wow. And um, and now um, here we are in Colorado, and uh, I was working for Lair's watering plants, and my mm. seven-year-old came to me and said, if all you're going to do is water plants, can we go home? <laughs> <laughs> so I, that Sunday, I started going over to Five Points, sitting in, and within three months, I got hired to do a wedding, and I've been working ever since in Denver. Wow. When did you work with Al Green? Years and moons and years and moons ago, <laughs> um, three guys from his band were from my neighborhood, and they needed someone to sing backup just for a couple of nights because the girl, I mean, a couple, yeah, a couple of weeks, the young lady that sang with them was pregnant, and her husband wanted her to stay home. She was having a really difficult time. So I did that, and I didn't really make a lot of money, but I had a lot of fun. Mm. And I was about 17, and it was uh, I, were, I was with them the month of July, 1970. Wow. And, uh, and when school was about to start, um, I said, guys, I had the time of my life, and I went home. <laughs> I, my brother came to pick me up, and we, we drove from Memphis back to Louisville. And it's one of the best memories of my life. Yeah. And I didn't work every job. I had a bunch of relatives in Memphis. So the nights I wasn't working, I stayed with them. Yeah. Was this up when Al Green was doing Oh, his, he was huge. Was he doing his, like, reborn gospel thing, or was he part of Oh, no, no, no. He was doing the nightclub thing. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. we, um, and I, I had to, I had to, I, had to I, I was 99 pounds. <laughs> And I had to gain weight because he was not, I didn't have the clothes he wanted me to wear, so I had to wear her costumes. Mm -hmm. And, um, but it worked out. I, I got up to like 120, 125 pounds and it fit. Yeah. And um, and I, I worked for that whole month and she came back and 
I went on home. Yeah. My mother was not going to let me stay any longer. <laughs> so that was that. Well, it definitely sounds like there was a there was a point in your life when you you weren't going to let your mother tell you what to do. You weren't going to oh. let, let some man tell you what to do. Either. No, I had to do I This year, June 30th, I will be 70 years old. Uh, I can honestly say I've had three day jobs in my entire life. You're a lifer. Hated it. I sing because I need it. Yeah. It makes my soul happy. It's how I pray. It's how I grieve. It's how I celebrate. When my mother passed away, we got that phone call. I was working with a band in Louisville. And they were the number one band, and I got the job quite by accident. They had fired their other singer. And I just walked in one, one Saturday night, and they let me sit in, hired me on the, on the sidewalk. I was leaving, and the guy stopped me on the sidewalk, said, you won't start next weekend. So I had a week to learn 30 songs. And uh, um, that's how I got over losing my mom, singing mm. at Joe's Palm Room with a band called Crisis. They were the number one band um, in Kentucky. They were everything. My brothers and sisters were so proud of me, mm -hmm. I didn't know what to do. My second son was six weeks and two days old. And I was so, I stayed put for six weeks. I stayed put. And I went in that night because <laughs> I needed it. And yeah. I was there for a year. And I didn't like I didn't like the way the band was, was going. They everybody was pretty drunk by the end of the night. I wasn't a drinker. Um and I didn't like it. And I started looking for different places to play, different people to play with that I didn't have to deal with drunks at the end of the night. I didn't yeah. have to deal with people that really obnoxious and our drummer got so drunk one night he fell off his drum stool no oh, jesus i heard a story of a, a drummer around here and i don't want to say who he is but <laughs> it, it came to the point of the show where there's a drum solo and he threw up all over the drums yeah so you don't you you don't work with people like that no That's not. I, I this is the best band i've ever had these guys they're professional. Yeah. They show up, nobody's drunk, nobody's high, nobody's weird. When we have a disagreement, we work it out at, at, at rehearsal. Mm -hmm. If it calls for venting, we let that person vent. Yeah. And then we look at him or him or her and go, what do you want to do? Mm -hmm. You got the problem, how do we solve it? How do you want us to solve it? And we work together and it's been fabulous. Um, as we are right now, we've been together Nine and a half years, and it's great. I'm going to ask you about your band and, and a bunch of other things, but <laughs> first, the premise of this uh, show or the angle of it is that you are stranded somewhere in the mountains of uh -oh. Colorado. Do you have a mountain town that's isolated that's like your favorite? I just found it, yeah? Cedar Edge. Where's that? Never heard of it. Been here 39 years. Played oh. there last Saturday night. I want to move there. Wow. Oh, my God. 2,500 people. It's um, it's just south of Grand Junction. Okay. Yeah. In the middle of Grand Mesa. It's fabulous. Is it by Fruta? It's out there. Yeah. It's it's yeah. about yeah. an hour from Fruta. Yeah. And it's it's the most incredible views. It's like if you're an atheist, drive through. Yeah, <laughs> you won't be an atheist when you when you get off the highway. The views are so amazing. You know that God is in heaven, wow. and that only God could create this. There's not a man on earth, living or dead, who could create this. It might be a woman, though. I did. doubt it. <laughs> That's one of the yeah. few things I'm absolutely sure of. <laughs> one of the things that I've learned about Colorado, because I've been here for 15 years. Really? Oh, oh gosh, yeah. I mean, there was a year that I wasn't here, but I have have um, cycled a lot of the state, and I've done mm -hmm. uh, ride the Rockies three times. It's always in a different. Okay, my jaw dropped. I'm just telling the oh. audience, my jaw dropped. <laughs> <laughs> it just takes training, you know. But wow. um, it 
you could spend your whole life here and you won't even see half of the state. There's always some town or mm-hmm. some um, mountain pass that you've never even heard of. Never you heard of. See, you know. When they called me, I, I, I said, well, okay. And then I, I hung up and thought, where the heck is this? Yeah. So I Googled it and I'm like, where in the world? It's three hours and 43 minute drive. From Denver. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So in this scenario, you might be there, but unfortunately there aren't any people. There's just you. And there might even be like a zombie apocalypse, you know, <laughs> something like that. And you are stranded and all you have in your little, like a cabin is food and water and a crank powered Victrola. Ooh. So you can bring five albums. So what is your first album? It would be Al Jarreau, Breaking Away, because all my favorite songs are on there. (laughs) Aretha Franklin is her second album. It's called uh, I Ain't Never Loved a Man. Respect is on there. Dr. Feel Good, Do Right Woman, Do Right Man. Anything by Earth, Wind, and Fire. Oh, yeah. Herbie Hancock, Headhunters. Nice. Oh, I love that. Yes. And uh, Gladys Knight, Imagination, because she's got Midnight Train to Georgia on there. Yeah. Those are my five? five. Yeah, that's five. Okay. And I could play them over and over. The only one I left out was uh, Sly and the Family Stone because I couldn't choose. Yeah. Couldn't choose. Well, this is just for today. you know. So if I ask you another time, you can give me five different Okay. Ones. Yeah. <laughs> so these five are all funky in some way. Mm-hmm. Um, they're all people of color as well. Mm-hmm. And I'm glad to have some of uh, that f- flavor on the show. You know, because a lot of the people who I interview are white. Oh. And unfortunately, white male, I would say. And um, I want to, um, I, I, one of the questions I wanted to ask you, and I don't know how to ask it is. Ask me. Is, well, first of all, you're still in Denver. Yeah. You live in Denver. You Have you lived there ever since you moved to Colorado? I've lived in Aurora. I'm in Arvada right now. I've, yeah. uh, I've lived in the Denver Metro area, yeah. but I've never lived outside of Denver Metro. For some reason, I think that you are um, more of a star um, in Boulder County than anywhere. Do you know that I played here so much back in the late 80s, early 90s, people thought I lived in Boulder, <laughs> but I couldn't afford to. <laughs> right, yeah. There was a woman who was hanging out here the other night, and I told her I was interviewing you. Her name is Valerie Lehman. She's about 35, and she mm-hmm. was saying, oh, my God, I got Hazel Miller to sign my stuffed animal <laughs> when I was, like, 12, and I still have it. So, um, yeah, you're just such a star out here. And I guess my question is, <laughs> what's it like being around all these white people? When we moved here, my six-year-old, Kenneth, he, we looked around, and we're in this McDonald's, and... He's like, Mama. I said, what, baby? There's no black people here. Mm-hmm. And we all started laughing. Yeah. And I said, well, that's okay. And about that time, this young man from the grill walked forward to the, to the, to the counter. I said, there's one. And we all started laughing. <laughs> <laughs> but I went to get an apartment. And uh, we'd been here. We'd been living in this horrible little hotel on Colfax, little motel. And I went to the front desk, and I said, we're checking out. I got an apartment. She goes, good, because this is not a good place for your, your boys. And I said, mm-hmm. okay, cool. I said, where do black people live in Denver? She goes, the few that there are are in northeast Denver. I said, oh, yeah, cool. That's where the apartment is. Mm-hmm. And um, and I remember asking my neighbor, I don't know, she said, we're about 5% of the state's population. And I said, well, is that good or bad? She goes, I like it. Mm. I left it alone. Yeah. Well, in Boulder, it's less than 5%. I would say it's more like 1% in but Boulder. I've walked on stage in Boulder and felt like Aretha Franklin. Yeah. People are so good to be in Boulder. I, I, yeah. I, can, I could pick up the phone and call um, the Boulder Theater, and they would let me open for somebody, mm-hmm. and I'd bring three guys and we'd make a hundred bucks a piece, hundred fifty bucks a piece, and that was serious. 
King Super's money. Yeah, yeah, right, right. <laughs> and you got three boys to feed, and these guys can eat. Yeah. So, I don't know. I, it's there's something about Colorado. That first five years, my sister's like, you coming back? I'm like, I think I'm home. Hmm. I think I'm home. After 10 years, I know I'm home. Yeah. I've been here 39 years come August 14th of this year. Wow. And I have, I thought I wanted to go on to L.A. like a first plan. Nope. Love is free. H.B. Wood Songs is Boulder's longest-running music shop, frequented by well-known local artists from Gregory Allen Isakoff to the String Cheese Incident. Starting as folk arts music in 1971, Wood Songs has been a hub for the Front Range's musical community for over 50 years, offering friendly, expert service to customers of all ages and all levels of musical experience. Wood Songs offers the community a vintage boutique vibe with modern conveniences and services. They're musicians too, so they get it. Wood Songs strives to be a place where all musicians, from beginners to pros, feel at home. Along with instrument sales and lessons, Wood Songs does brass and woodwind repairs and features Colorado's finest string repair shop, located directly across the street. Stop by Wood Songs in Boulder today or check them out online at hbwoodsongs.com. There is nothing I could have done in L.A. to top what I've done in Colorado. Yeah. I've had the time of my life. I've met some of the coolest people in the world in Colorado, including you. <laughs> <laughs> Probably the nerd, like one of the nerdiest people you've ever. Oh, I like just, nerdy people. Just to be fair. Yeah. <laughs> okay, this is one of my deep dark secrets, and I'm gonna share it. I love men who wear glasses. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah. I know it's a stereotype, but they're usually very smart, hmm. and they're usually very kind, and they're usually just nerdy enough that they like the books I like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I should have asked you your five books that you would take to to the cabin too. See, for me, I I love Hemingway, but I love um, I, I I I love biographies. Yeah, I do, I do, and I just I I love books with that point of view of that's so different than my own. Yeah, and um, uh, a. a, a I can't think of her name. She just got an award today. She's the first black woman to win a Pulitzer. Oh, wow. Uh, Tony. Uh, Tony Morrison? Tony Morrison. Oh, yeah. I mean. I didn't know about her till I moved to Colorado. And I love her, love her, love her. Yeah. And I just, I, I, I've learned a lot. Colorado has given me a different perspective. It's given me a different way to look at the world. It's no longer black and white. It's no longer hmm. have and have nots. Yeah. I have more problems getting a job as a woman singer than being a black woman singer. Hmm. Yeah. I've had a I've had problems being the band leader because I'm a woman. And uh, and they've learned to deal with me. <laughs> I do want to ask you though and um I'm working on this. I'm um independently um reaching out to people but is there a community of African American musicians in in the area who you are in touch with who you can help me get on this show? Really? Hundred percent. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. The first person that comes to mind. <laughs> the first person that comes to mind is a, a drummer, Philip Waitman. Okay. From Hot Lunch. You know the band? I do not. They are mm. the best funk band anywhere, but the best funk band that Colorado's ever produced. And Philip is a drummer to be reckoned with. Okay. Yeah. I just sat down with Dave Watts from the Motet, and we talked about drums. He's just, amazing. Just drums. Yeah, he's a great guy. Yeah. I remember yeah. when they were playing 
uh, they were openers at at the Fox Theater, mm -hmm. and I kept thinking these kids are gonna kick some butt, yeah. and they did. Yeah, they did. He's they a could great use drummer. you as their lead motet with Hazel Miller would be the shit. I'd love that. to sit in with them that one night. Yeah. Oh my god, we play one of their songs. My my guitar player brought in one of their songs. One two three. I'm going to send Dave a text and see when you can sing <laughs> with them. Yeah. Um, so you, your plan was to go to L.A. Yeah. And you made it to Denver. To Denver. So um, was there a time that you thought, I'm going to be a recording artist? And no. th And now, oh, that just didn't even happen. Well, my big dream for L.A. was I'm going to be a recording artist. And I, the live audiences in Colorado... Cut that short. Mm. It's like, how in the world can I walk into a studio and get the love in there and the ability to sing like I sing to a live audience? So I don't do well in the studio. Almost everything we've ever recorded, we recorded live. This song, Hard Times Come Again No More. Yeah. You sound like Coco Taylor. Really? You, what a compliment. You just like... So when you're saying that you can't studio whatever, you slayed on that. We did that live at Elch Pulchback. So that's there you go. That's they got Todd and the Monsters. Yeah, yeah. And they were like, just just sing it. Yeah. And we w they rented it out for an afternoon, and for me, I, it was like I I've, I've been playing the Peck since 1985. I miss that place so oh, much. So I want somebody much. to buy it and open it. Yeah, but keep it the same. Keep it like keep it, was. it the same. Yeah. Yeah, keep it kind of shitty. <laughs> that's, but that's clean the bathroom. Life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but you do have albums, and you come through on the albums as like really gritty. And I love that the one album just starts with this line: "Put down your cell phone," oh. and she's pissed as hell, and and like. Um, Baby, put down yeah. your cell phone. Oh my God. He ain't going to call you back tonight. <laughs> <laughs> but the music, or I shouldn't say the music, um, the instrumentation is... Um, bare bones. Bare bones, but it's kind of like silky. And um, it, it's not like a Muddy Waters, you know, Chicago blues. It's more keyboards, yeah. and, you know, and, and things like that. So it, it seems like that's more your style, whereas you are really gritty the band <laughs> they're smooth it's smooth oh, they're smooth. smooth is the exact right word mm -hmm. yeah because i like the i like the what do they call it i was an english major the juxtaposition there you go that i'm i'm over here and they're over there and we meet in the middle yeah and it's fun yeah it's a lot of fun yeah and this summer that's one of the songs that i thought maybe no one had ever listened to we're going to play more of our originals this summer because I'm getting to the point where, you know, let's let's see if people really are listening rather than just dancing. Do you know Danny Schaefer? Yeah. You know, so he has this great line. And when I'm on stage playing drums with Clay Rose, oh. a, a lot of times we say this to each other. We say, let's give these people exactly what we want. We walk out, uh, we play Tuesday night at the Boulder Dinner Theater, and it was Valentine's night, and you know, everybody's on a date. And we had every intention of going out playing nothing but love songs. By the end of the third songs, third song, I looked back at the boys, and I said, <laughs> y'all, I'm changing the script. And they're like, I'm, they know I'm, I'll do it. And they're like, what are we doing? I said, we're going to play what we need. Yeah, yeah. And the next thing I knew, the place was jumping all night long jump in the band's gotta have fun because if we're not the crowd, they're not fun. yeah exactly and the bands you go to see don't you go because you know they're gonna have you up and jumping yeah yeah that's why that's the one thing i've always loved about boulder there's a lot of black bands in denver that they get your mind going but the bands up here that get your mind and soul going, that's in Boulder. Which ones can you name? The, um, I like I like your band. Uh, say the name. Gasoline I'm, Lollipops. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I like um, back in the day the samples. Yeah. I'm one of those people that thought that Big Ed Todd and the Monsters were from Boulder. 
I did. I met them at the yeah. Walnut Room. You toured with them for a yeah, while, Yeah, I right? toured with them yeah. for several years. I was yeah. on the bus for at least four years. Yeah. And um, there's bands that have come out of here that make you know that there's something in the mix up here in Boulder that can't be found anywhere else in Colorado. Hmm. Can't be found. I've never felt like that about the bands in Colorado Springs. Definitely not the bands in the mountains. And um, it's just, it's Boulder. It's something about Boulder. That's why all the bands that have done extremely well nationally, 99% of you guys are from Boulder. <laughs> Gregory Allen... Isakov and uh, oh String God. Cheese Incident. String and, Cheese. And oh. Yeah. Uh, I've got a friend, Cheryl Renee. She's been singing back up on their uh, albums for several years now, maybe at least five years now. So let's talk about your band. You, you said that you've, you know, you've had the same players now for, yeah, for almost, almost a 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, where did well, you... my keyboard player and I have been playing together. It'll be 44 years Jeez. this spring. Wow. When I moved to Colorado, I knew Dana, his wife, Roberta, and their dog, Muffy. That's it. And he was one of the reasons I stopped in Denver. Mm -hmm. And he's like, Hazel, if you stay here, you'll love it. And he was right. Uh, I met Rich because of him, my bass player. They, they've been playing together more than 35 years. Um, my guitar player's been with me nine years. This kid is 29 years old. Mm -hmm. He's a powerhouse. What's his name? Um, this, <laughs> uh, I call him the one and only. Yeah. He, um, and look, uh, you got you to gotta edit this out. He'll kill me. <laughs> Cody Carbone. Uh, Cody's been playing professionally since he was about nine. Is and that his Pat Carbone's kid? Yeah. yeah no you know Pat? Pat? Yeah. See? Oh, yeah. yeah. He's been in his father's bluegrass band since he was about nine. That's a good family. Oh, my God. I yeah. love their family band. Yeah. Yeah. I drove all the way up to Morrison one night, took my sister. We had a ball. She was visiting from Kentucky. We had a ball. We danced. We hung out. We were the only black people in the place. <laughs> <laughs> it was worth it. But um, uh, let's see. My drummer is Brian Mikulich. You know Brian. Brian's one of those first call. Um, I stole him from a studio gig. Um, a session. He's a session guy. Mm -hmm. Stole him. Um, uh, Coco Brown is the other singer. Oh my God. Coco, first night I saw Coco, there were five women vocalists, five black ladies. We all went to see her because we'd heard about her. And we all looked at each other and went, she better not move here. <laughs> <laughs> Two years later, she moved here. But luckily for us, she's a great person. She is, she never sang jazz, and I pounded it into her. And I had her sing this Sarah Vaughn song, mm. and I had to leave the stage because I was in tears. Mm. It was like Sarah Vaughn was standing on my stage. Wow. She has that sassy, silky thing going on. <gasps> Coco's, she has perfect pitch. And I don't know many singers that can say that. Mm. If I'm singing the wrong notes, she'll lean over <laughs> and she'll nudge me and go, sing this. And she'll sing it in my ear. Okay. Wow. And people are always wondering what we're laughing about. Right. That's what we're laughing. She's giving you shit. Yeah. yeah. Hazel, sing this. Yeah. <laughs> I was listening to, um, I mean, I hope that anybody um, who listens to this episode realizes that you're not just a live singer. You have these records. They're on Spotify. Yeah. You listen to them. Yeah. And they're badass. And um, after listening to some of the original songs, I had a question for you. Okay. Are you still looking? No. No? No. No? No. Okay. When, that, when, uh, when we got that song, the songwriter was a young man um, that Chris Daniels turned me on to. He lived in... Uh, Nebraska. Yeah. I thought it was so cool. And we added that bass intro. Mm -hmm. He he loved it. Because it had a really kind of folky intro. And we... Yeah. And we were, we were channeling Sly and the Family Stone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Larry Graham. Yeah. And um, I, I guess I was looking back then, but that was 1995. No. No. Mm -hmm. I'm too old for that mess. 
I'm a workaholic. I like it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I keep saying I'm going to retire. And then I look in the mirror and go, and do what? Right. Yeah. So I, I guess I'm hoping that I'll be as lucky as um, some of my some of my uh, mentors, my my uh, the people I admire, and sing till I want to stop singing. Mm -hmm. Who are some of your heroes? Oh my God, Ella Fitzgerald. Um, don't laugh. I love Doris Day. Oh yeah. Cleanest voice ever. Love Doris Day. Um, love Sarah Vaughn. I love Bonnie Raitt. I will take the night off and go see Bonnie mm. Raitt. And I don't care if it's the cheap seats. I'm going to yeah. sit up there and rock. <laughs> she does it for me. It's something about the soulfulness she brings to the stage that I just sit there and shake my head. Yeah. I love, I love, I love Al Jarreau. Yeah, that was your first, that was your number one choice. I, I, um, at Mishawaka, we were sitting out back, and he came out that side door. And he stood there and started talking to us. And we were like, oh, my God. And my next-door neighbor didn't know who, she, who he was. She's this young, young kid, mm -hmm. and she didn't realize he was hitting on her. Right. <laughs> she was about 26, 27, maybe. And, um... So he went back in, and she goes, is he in the band? I'm like, baby, he <laughs> is the band. And me and my friend's like, he's Al Jarreau. Oh, this is the guy we came to see, because it was the break between the opener and the, the main act. He comes out the side door. We met Al Jarreau. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> well, famous people love it when you don't recognize them, too. Oh. So that's attractive, actually. You know. He had, She had yeah. no idea who he was, and he was hitting on her like it was going out of style. <laughs> she had no idea. <laughs> We still tease her about it. Um, 25 years later, we still tease her about it. But we, one of the ladies that I'm, I'm really, really, um, Mc, Mc, Sarah McLaughlin. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I did an E-Town show. I didn't know who she was. Mm -hmm. I sang back up for whoever was out front. Mm -hmm. That girl sings mm -hmm. like... Wow. The only other person I know that sings like that is um, she's local. And uh, I can't oh, say her name. Her husband's name is Rich Moore. Oh, gosh. I'm not sure. It'll hit me at the yeah. wrong time. Yeah. But, uh, but there's, there's, some, there's some ladies in Colorado that have truly caught my attention. And, and I'm one of, those, one of those people that I'll go listen to somebody and steal a little here, yeah. steal a little there. <laughs> A great artist takes what he needs. Mm -hmm. That was that was a quote by like Donatello or something. <laughs> it's but, just, yeah, yeah. I I I loved Gladys Knight because when I was a teenager, everybody said I sounded like her. Uh, when I first started out, every band I was in had me sing all these Aretha songs, so I always thought I sounded like that. Right. And then Gladys, oh, she's amazing. Uh, I've opened for her twice. Never, never met her, but we met the the, the pips. Yeah. <laughs> they were nice guys. But I'm, I like uh, Patty Labelle. Walked in our dressing room. We opened for her. We did the um, all star benefit for the Nuggets. Oh. She was the headliner. She walked in our dressing room, and we all just kind of fell over. Mm -hmm. And she, oh, honey, blah blah, and. Uh, Oh my God, it's Patty LaBelle. <laughs> and we we got to stand in the wings and watch her set. She's amazing. Mm. And she's, let's see, if I'm going to be 70, Patty's got to be in her late 70s. Mm. And she's one of the few singers who can still hit those notes. Well, a lot of young women and, you know, just young people in this area, they go and see Hazel Miller. Really? Oh, yeah. Okay, cool. And they say, someday... Okay. I want to sing like that. I mean, it's not just your voice, though. It's it's the stage presence. And a lot of people are, are either musically good or they have energy on stage. I'm one of the people who has the energy, but not the musicianship. Like, <laughs> you have both. You're a great drummer. What are you talking about? I've seen you. I've seen the band. I've got energy, but not the, the you know, musicianship, you know. I'd have to agree. I'd have to <laughs> agree that, that you're... 
great at both. And I have to disagree with what you think. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to see if I can lead you back around to where I, what I think. Have you ever mentored someone in a way where you see them on stage and, you know, they can sing in tune or they can play their instrument, but they don't have it? Yeah. And I, there's a young lady. She's from Lafayette. I think she's 17. Her name is Julia Kirkwood. Uh, first night we saw her, Coco and I were like, oh my God, she was 13. Mm. I think she's eight, 17 or 18 now. Um, she was astounding. I was amazed. And I talked to her on the phone, and then the next time I'd see her, she would come a little more out of her shell, mm. and a little more and a little more. And Coco's like, she heard us. Mm. And then I have a another young lady. Her name is Bree Wiesner. She's going to be a freshman in the fall at CSU. And she just auditioned for their music uh, department. And uh, her mother sent me a piece of a, a video, a small. Coco and I, this little white girl with big blue eyes and long blonde hair, she had this incredible voice, and she'd stand in one spot and close her eyes. Yeah. And little by little, we got her out of her shell. Every Christmas, she comes to sing with me at the Soil Dove. And last Christmas, she rocked the stage so hard, Coco and I ran out on stage yeah. and helped her. Yes. And she goes, these are my musical mamas. <laughs> and I'm like, you did it. And I'm like, give it up. She did a, a, a version of Do You Hear What I Hear? And it was like listening to, um, do you know the lady that, sing, uh, that did Street Life? Street Life, I know. I play that Street Life, the Jazz Crusaders. I'm going to have to look this up now. Because, oh. you know, <laughs> she know. sounded like that. She nailed this. She yeah. and her dad, just her and her dad. And, and she sang this song and she put this jazz touch on this old Christmas tra uh, holiday song, you know? Yeah. All my stars. So we used to nudge her and go, you better throw a little gospel in that. And mm -hmm. she's all that in a bag of chips. <laughs> she and Julia are my hopes. Yeah. Julia's this young black kid from Lafayette. And then I've got Bree way down in southeast Denver. And I think the two of them are going to change mm -hmm. the face of music for women in Colorado. There is a certain thing that they don't teach in school that you know you either have to play shows for 40 years and, <laughs> and learn it um or if you're lucky enough when you're younger you can meet somebody like you who just grabs you by the shoulders and says have fun out there yeah you, you know we we uh when the the uh, owner of the uh broncos passed away <laughs> i got a call from his daughters asking us if asking me if i could put together a small gospel choir to sing at the cathedral in downtown Denver. So I did. So I needed a soprano. So I called the mayor's wife and I called Bree. And I think, I think she was 14 and we gave her a solo. And um, I gave her Amazing Grace because I knew, and I said, now when you sing this song, you sing it like you heard me sing it. And she stepped up to her father was playing keys and he gave her the intro. And she stepped up, and I kicked her foot. She went, oh, May. I looked at Coco. I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> oh, man. She has found that inner voice. Yeah. She rocks. She absolutely, she's 18 now. She apps. I'm, I know she got that spot at CSU because there's no way they could turn her down. Yeah. No way. But that's when you know, and I got to... There's some new young singers around. Jenny Shawhan, have you heard her yet? No. She's no. got a great new band. She's wonderful. She's got a voice to be reckoned with. I'd say she's probably 28, 29. There's there's some there's some singers. There's some bands and in, in, I'm gonna I've got a bunch of time off in March, and um, my band has three jobs in March, so my plan is to go out and hear some new bands. Um, so there's a super group called Big Richard. No. That's new. So Where? 
they've only been around for a year and a half, but they've already played Telluride and Rocky Grass. They're going to be headlining Red Rocks soon. I mean, they are, they are, it's like the Spice Girls of Bluegrass is what they're saying. Yes. They're like, they're, they, have, yes. they all have that, what I'm talking about, the it, you mm-hmm. know, but then they all know their instruments on like a world-class level. I got to go see, you got to call me, you know how to find me. Yeah. Call me and we'll go see them. Yeah. Well, and the, you know, well, they the, don't play locally that much, do they? Oh, they're headlining the Boulder Theater in a couple of weeks. Yeah. What night? Please let me be off, Lord. Please <laughs> let me be off. I'll text you. Text and they, um, they're all about uh, turning. The world of bluegrass is so stale and all this. Um, so their onstage banter is all sex jokes, and <laughs> and their fans bring inflatable penises to the show. <laughs> so it's like it's this high level of. Music. I love you, girls. But then they're having this. Having fun. Having fun, exactly. And you're making the audience family. Yeah, yeah. Because if you can laugh together and my dumb jokes, we're good. <laughs> yeah. We're good. Yeah, yeah. And and nothing should be off limits, you know? So you said before about how um, you don't allow, um, you know, sloppy a- alcoholics in your band. Uh, I can't do it. But I did hear from the staff. At Cafe Soleil, do you like some tequila? I do, but yeah. I limit myself. Uh, even on my birthday, yeah, two shots, I'm dead. Yeah. Uh, I remember one night having four shots because I thought I was grown up mm. and could barely make it to the end of the show at Cafe Soleil. Yeah. <laughs> and I called him the next day and apologized oh. and apologized and apologized. And to this day, I have never done it again. I, he laughs so hard. Oh, he's the nicest guy. And he's like, Hazel, it's fine. You told some crazy jokes and everybody <laughs> loved it. That's great. But I did. I had four shots and that's, I don't even have four shots at home. Right. Yeah. And that was way over my lip. Some people came in I hadn't seen in a long time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Grow up, Miss Thing. You can't have four shots. <laughs> they will be dragging you. Uh, a friend of mine, you know Satir? Satir, I don't think she so. books um, Rock and Rails oh, the, in the uh, Nawa. Nawa. Yeah, yeah. She drove me home. And, she, and the next day I had to get a ride from, and uh, come back and get my van full of gear sitting in the parking lot. <laughs> yeah. I have been there hundreds of times. Hopefully, not anytime soon. Well, that's one of two in 40, no, 50 years, so I'm okay. Yeah, there you go. That was one yeah. of two. So as you approach um, 70. <laughs> isn't, that, as, isn't that weird? Yeah, and as you approach 40 years in, in Colorado soon, mm-hmm. um, uh, uh, what are your goals? Like, what do you have left that you want to achieve? I, w- I, want, I want to call up people like you and say, hey, let's go hear a band, because I know you know bands I don't know. Same. And yeah, and yeah. and I'd love to call you up one night and say I got two tickets. Let's go see Hot Lunch. Yeah, this the, this is funk at. It. I wouldn't follow them on a show if they gave me a thousand dollars. Wow. For me, they are that dangerous. I'm sure people say that about you. Who no, wants to follow uh-uh. Hazel Miller? Come These on. These guys. Oh my God. It's like, it's it's, it's like being in church, the Church of Funk. They they know it, they understand it, they play it, they breathe it. Wow. Everybody in the band sings. It's un it's unbelievable. It's like watching Sly and the Family Stone when you when they once in a blue moon would be on TV. Right. But I my goal is to hear some new people. Some people are trying to get me involved in um going to different high schools and talking to their singers and um i'm gonna do it i don't know what i'm gonna tell them i'm just gonna sit there and let them ask me a bunch of questions yeah but i i think at this point i've recorded i've sung with national acts i remember being in kobe japan for the ted conferences before mm-hmm. it became ted talks when yeah. it was new i did it for 11 years Oh, my only job was to walk out three mornings, sing something a cappella, and walk out. That wow. was my job. We were in Kobe, 
And a voice behind me said, Hazel. And I turned, and it was Herbie Hancock. Wow. His singer didn't make it from L.A. Hazel, you got two songs you can sing with me tomorrow? I said, yes, sir. He goes, what do you want to sing? And I thought about it. And I told him the two songs. And he said, okay, I'll see you about, about 7 o'clock. I said, yes, sir. And I'm in Kobe. I didn't own a cell phone. And uh, I had nobody I could call. <laughs> so I went downstairs in the hotel and sent out an email to everybody I knew. Mm -hmm. I'm singing with Herbie Hancock tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. <laughs> and I got a bunch of responses that I didn't see till the next day. But I said, I sang Green Dolphin Street. And I sang, um, here's that rainy day. Wow. Because those are the only two I actually knew the key. I don't read music. Mm. So I had to pick two songs that I knew the keys so I could tell them I didn't have any charts. I'm sure you slayed. slayed he it. shook my hand and hugged me. And I ran off the stage so I could go to the ladies' room and cry. Uh -huh. I was, that's a day until they put throw the dirt on me. I will never, ever forget. And every time I've seen him since, he knew my name. That is, I got this, um, he was playing behind Diane Reeves, the greatest living jazz singer in the whole world. And she said, Hazel Miller's in the house. Let's sing some blues, Hazel. And I turned and looked towards the stage. And Herbie went like this. He's waving like, come up. And my friend was with me. She kicked me so hard in the shin, I was bruised for about a week. And I went up and we did Meet Me With Your Black Draws On. Wow. Two of the biggest names in jazz ever. And I got to sing with them. I was, I was no good. You were no good? I was no good. I, well, by that, I mean, I was... If they'd have asked me where my could you drive home, I'd have had to say no. Right. <laughs> Can I get a cab, please? Right. It was like drinking four shots of tequila. Right. Right. <laughs> I, I, I've had moments like that in Colorado that would never have happened to me in L.A. and it would never have happened to me in Louisville. So, yeah, Colorado's my home. Yeah. I love it here. If I can help some young kid that is looking for a way to break out, First thing I tell them is get a good lawyer. And if you're going to book yourself, call me. I'll, I'll try to teach you how to book yourself because mm -hmm. I've been booking myself here for 35 years. No one can do it better than you, really. Well, I've had agencies. Well, you'll never work. And I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Bye. Yeah. But I don't want to give you 40%. I don't want to give you 30%. I got three mouths to feed. Mm. It's all right if I don't have dinner. It's not all right if they don't have dinner. Right. Because they came with me for the ride. I got to take care of them until they're gone. The last thing that I wanted to ask you was just that I'm going to be going to Louisville for the first time in my life in May or June. What should I check out there? Um, I'm going to give you my sister's phone number. Yeah? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, two of them that that go and they know they're good bands, yeah. and they will take care of you. I oh, promise. Oh hell yeah, that sounds amazing. They will take care of. They'll feed you till you drop. All right. So bring it. Bring your your elastic pants, because <laughs> all my sisters are great cooks, and they will feed you till you drop, and they will take you out and show you where all the music is. That sounds good to me. But if if you get a chance, go to Joe's Palm Room. It's been there as long as I can remember. As long it was the first black owned nightclub in the whole state. One hundred percent. I'm gonna mm -hmm. go I will. You what are you going to Louisville for? We have a friend who is from there who wants to go and and show it to us, but then there's also um one of the bands that I really, really love, Murder by Death. They live Why do I know there. That? They play at the Stanley Hotel every year, but they live in Louisville and they own a restaurant there, an Italian restaurant. So I've always wanted to go check that out. So, um, it was good food, really Joe's good food. And Joe's Palm yeah, yeah. Room. Yeah, thanks for sitting down with me to chat. It's really, really fun. Yeah, <laughs> this was a hoot. I was scared to death. <laughs> We're gonna say goodbye to the goodbye. listeners, <laughs> and I'm gonna give you some CBD gummies from the dab. <laughs> I am. 
Yeah. And if you're looking for a way to sleep, go to DAPS. <laughs> That was the unforgettable Hazel Miller, and I'm so honored that she sat down with me. Um, please do go to DAPS, as Hazel said. <laughs> really, um, go to the DAB303.com or any DAB location in the next 30 days and get 10% off of your purchase if you mention this episode of My Last Stash. I am also extremely grateful uh, to Wood Songs for their support of this episode. Wood Songs is the place to go along the front range for instrument sales and repair and lessons. Uh, see you next Monday for another episode of Mile High Stash. Please do leave a, a review on Apple Podcasts as well if you can. It goes a long way and um, I appreciate all the listeners and even the CBD gummies. I do. I'm going to try to go to sleep now. Even though I know this must seem real now Everything will fall I want to go back to Montreal